Good afternoon. Hi. On this great sunny day, we have a, a nice crowd. Uh, and this is, this is the, the um, welcome that uh, I was hoping for, for our chancellor-elect, um, so that he can see greater St. Louis. <laughs> and um, you definitely represent that because you have uh, gone through the weather and you are here. So we're gonna start uh, our program and what you're gonna be um, uh, exposed to is act one of a trilogy which you see on your brochures and on your program. And you see on the back of your program that Act 2 and Act 3 will follow, and we definitely expect and hope to see you uh, at that time. We're going to uh, start the program as <clears throat> uh, we start programs in the black community with prayer. And I'm going to ask my pastor, um, Gary Gaston, who is the uh, pastor of my church, which is St. Paul, uh, which is in East St. Louis, and I'll ask him to come forward and give us a prayer. Please stand and bow your head. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far by faith, we thank you. We thank you for this icy day, yet glorious day. We thank you for all that are assembled here. And we thank you for the visions of the coordinators and the students of the Black Studies Program. Lord, we just ask your blessings upon this program, this great university. Lord, we thank you for 400 years of, of uh, our ancestry, we thank you for their contributions to this great country. Lord, we thank you for the struggle, for we yet stand, and Lord, we thank you for all that's ahead. It is in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray, amen. You know, prayer is um, essential, uh, especially as we go through this segment, this particular act of our trilogy, because it represents the uh, great uh, yoke of slavery that we have experienced. And prayer was the light, and it was the avenue through which we traveled uh, and to which we had the opportunity to um, give thanks for being alive and also the thanks for being free. Because freedom was something that we always looked forward to and something that we always aspired to accomplish. But along with prayer, we had songs, spirituals, um, and spirituals played dual roles in the black community. Of course, it would uh, be a salve for uh, the hurt and the pain and the misery, but it also would be a way of communicating to our um, fellows certain codes, certain messages, like for instance, the song, Steal Away to Jesus, was a song that had in it the code, the appropriate time to run away from the plantation. Also, and many other spirituals, uh, were given the code words for where to go, when to go, and other kinds of messages. You've had the opportunity to hear the drummers, and the drummers are 
um, those individuals in our communities that can communicate across dialects uh, and that the drum for all practical purposes really was part of our armory because through our drums we would communicate what was about us, what was coming upon us, and how we might elude situations that would be dangerous. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that is real communications. The problem, of course, is that they never let us bring the drum to America. You can understand why that would be so, that blacks could communicate across plantations and they could communicate in a language that could not be understood by any except blacks. And so the drum and the spiritual and prayer were instruments in the black community that gave us solace, that gave us strength, and gave us stamina. And so now I'd like for us to uh, turn to and listen to some spirituals. And so under the direction of Darrell Booker, uh, I would appreciate if we could have the choir. Good afternoon. It brings me great pleasure to join you all this afternoon to help celebrate of Blacks in America 400 years plus. I am Daryl Booker. I'm the rector of the Missouri Conference Choir of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the oldest denomination in the United States, the oldest black denomination in the United States. So we deem it a pleasure to be here and join you today. Today we'll be singing two songs, those two songs, Shoshalosa and City Call Heaven. Shoshalosa and a City Call Heaven. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, neighbor. Shoshalosa. Kules untaba. Haha. Stime la se pume. South Africa. Turn to the person on your other side and say, neighbor. Win you ya balega. Kules untaba. Stime la se pume. South Africa. Now turn to the person behind you and say, neighbor. Kule boom. Ladies and gentlemen, the Missouri Conference Choir of the African Methodist Episcopal Church.
As you can see, <clears throat> spirituals are uplifting, sustaining, and of course, enabled us to carry a great yoke. I look at the audience out there and I see it really filling up. That's a, a very heartwarming sight, especially uh, as you uh, probably uh, did not go to other activities today because you were told that they were closed and that it was uh, so inclement that it was impossible for the services to be held. And so I salute you <laughs> for being... <laughs> I also want to uh, salute um, some people who were instrumental in helping uh, this event to take place. Uh, you see a number of people walking uh, with sashes across their shoulders. Why don't you just stand up? These are the people who were the ushers, usherettes, uh, and they have played a yeoman's job in making everything very comfortable and amenable. Uh, I also had the pleasure of having a committee um, that really did the yeoman's work uh, for this activity. Um, and I had the, the pleasure, of course, of, of just uh, sitting and watching, observing, and occasionally grunting uh, as they were able to uh, uh, pull off, I think, a very uh, spectacular event. Actually, um, there were over 800 people who really uh, uh, said that they would love to attend. Um, and of course, the weather being a factor, they uh, could not come. Uh, but that's the kind of uh, audience that I think uh, says volumes about uh, an, an event such as this. <clears throat> Um, imagine the title, Blacks in America, 400 years plus. Uh, why the plus? Uh, the plus, of course, is because blacks were on the North American shore many years before Columbus. And there is a history of blacks and Africa and a heritage that obviously uh, needs to be told, has not been told, and was in the process of being told some perhaps 50 years ago when we had a program that came on this campus. It was Black Studies. Black Studies was a program where black scholars were knocking at the door and saying, <clears throat> why not black studies? <clears throat> Excuse me. Why don't we have a program, a discipline at this university that's black studies? And it was followed with protest. Um, but also it was received with some reluctant acceptance and then some acceptance. And so Black Studies came, and I was blessed and fortunate to have been a part of that, to be a co-founder of Black Studies. <clears throat> and what we were protesting for was, of course, presence. We wanted to be numbered among the student population and faculty. And we wanted to not only uh, protest to move forward as a people, but we recognized that moving forward as a university was paramount. And so we protested and we demanded numbers to be increased. 
Now, in that protest, um, it obviously was a message of not only for equity, but it was a message that basically said that without the black contributions, um, no institution uh, could in itself be relevant and be avant-garde. <clears throat> and so we not only protested, but uh, things changed. You know, change is a wonderful thing, but change does not necessarily equal progress. And so we pursued, we persevered, uh, and then we found that we had um, cohorts, um, alliances, uh, and people basically concluding that they recognize that in order to be a first-class university, it had to boast not only <clears throat> of its diversity, <clears throat> but it had to boast of the fact that it had scholasticism among its diversity that was equal to that of any. And so in the process of all of these um, struggles, we found heroes, we found champions, we found people who concluded <clears throat> that it was obvious something that needed to happen, should happen, and must happen. And so I want to introduce to you <clears throat> now one of the individuals who was one of the champions in this cause. <clears throat> and she holds a dual uh, appointment. You can see her on your flyer, your brochure. Her name is Adrienne Davis. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things written about her on this um, little uh, space, but it doesn't even begin to make an indentation to what this person has done. Uh, because it only talks about achievements, it doesn't talk about endurance, and it doesn't talk about character. And I'd like to introduce you to this person right now, who I think has played a yeoman's role in helping us move forward in what is a major step in advancing the black student body and black faculty and black staff on this university. Adrian. <clears throat> Welcome. <laughs> Especially on this day where my goal was to not end up face down or face up on the sidewalk. Um, I would like to thank my senior colleague, the extraordinary Jack Kirkland. Some people believe that becoming an academic means leaving behind childish things. Things like caring for others, activism, and a deep and abiding belief that we all have a responsibility to repair the deep injustices of the world. Jack shows us the profound untruth of this myth. He embodies the activist scholar and he inspires me every day and makes me proud to be a member of our community. Jack, thank you for the first in this crucial trilogy, which you call Act One. I look forward to the next two acts. The arm of the black slave trade is long, and it casts its shadow fully on our region. 
Missouri was born in the crucible of American slavery, forged from the fires of racial supremacy, and hardened in the cooling of racial compromise. The judge for whom I worked, Judge A. Leon Higginbotham, wrote of the three cases that define race and Missouri. Dred Scott, our St. Louis courthouse, a shrine to formalizing American black people as unworthy of citizenship or humanity. The case of Celia, in which a Missouri court condemned to death an enslaved teenager who in self-defense killed the white man who had sexually assaulted her regularly since he bought her at the age of 14. Upholding her primary value as her master's sexual property, the court condemned Celia to be executed, but ordered a stay until her baby was born and could be given to her dead master's family as part of his estate. And of course, Shelley versus Kramer, in which the Missouri Supreme Court upheld the restrictive covenants that protected racial segregation and kept African Americans from fully realizing the value of that American dream, home ownership. If Missouri, our state, sits in the long shadow of slavery, St. Louis has emerged as the embodiment of the national crisis over the urban core. Racial segregation in the built environment, deep and abiding educational, health, and economic disparities, the political chokehold, and of course, inequities in policing and access to justice. As Washington University in St. Louis, we too sit in the shadow of slavery, Jim Crow, and the challenge of the American urban core. Yet great universities solve the problems of the world, and racial injustice is one of the great problems of our world. Across Forest Park, my colleagues at the Medical Center literally cure cancer. We, too, have been tackling one of the great problems, racial injustice. Now, given the long arc of slavery, our efforts towards racial justice are still young. But I'd like to share, at Jack's invitation, some of our efforts as a testament to what we all can do and what we each can do when we try to walk our values. Jack mentioned the increase in our numbers of African-American faculty members. This is something the university had long been struggling to do, and it is something that all universities struggle to do. I am proud to say that because of the unflagging commitment of my colleagues, my chancellor, my provost, my deans, and above all, my colleagues, the faculty, we have increased our number of African-American faculty 108% in the last eight years. And in case you're wondering, it wasn't two to four. <laughs> We've gone from 24 to 51 African-American faculty members on the Danforth campus. And I wake up every morning, and I feel like I'm coming and walking into a community. Administrator, we know that things do not change without changing the complexion and the values of leadership. Because of the commitment of our most senior leaders, our chancellor and our executive team, we've increased our number of senior black administrators. And by that, I mean people with the word chancellor or provost in their title. We've increased that number from the last five years, excuse me, the last eight years, from four to 19. I'm including in that number 
our still new and wonderful rock star athletic director, Anthony Ozma. He doesn't have chancellor or vice provost in his title, but he sure as heck leads us every day on the athletic field. So still welcome to, welcome to Anthony. <laughs> Research universities aren't doing very much if we're not educating and giving access to the best education to everybody. I'm incredibly proud, and I can take no credit on this, but I'm incredibly proud of my colleagues in the Department of Admissions and the vice, our former Vice Provost for Admissions, John Berg, and our current Vice Provost for Admissions, Renee Turner, for increasing our percentage of African American students from 6% to 12%. Now we still have a long way to go to get close to any kind of meaningful representation of St. Louis or full, true, and equal access. But I will say, I think it was four years ago, that the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education recognized Washington University, which historically had been at the bottom of their list, as being tied with Columbia University at the very top of our peer set with the largest incoming class of African American students. And I say we did that with no athletic scholarships. Along with admitting a more diverse class is that our students put pressure on us, and thank goodness for our students, because without student activism that brought us black studies, not only at Washington University, but throughout universities and higher education, without our students, we wouldn't continue to fully move forward. How many students are here today? If you're a student today, please stand up. It doesn't matter where you're a student. If you're a student today, please stand up. It doesn't matter where you're a student, it doesn't matter how old you are, if you are a student, you are the future. We have been doing a lot, pushed by our students. I really want to give them credit for their activism and their advocacy in educating us. We have been pushed by our students to build an infrastructure to more fully welcome everyone into this university. And I'll just note two of the things that we have put in place. One is a Center for Diversity and Inclusion, a 21st century infrastructure for supporting students and teaching them the key skills for understanding and negotiating difference and also supporting them when they experience the horrific but inevitable microaggressions, mediaggressions, and macroaggressions of life in the United States. I also commend and compliment my colleagues and students at Student Affairs for creating a bias report system, one that anyone can report any act of harassment, discrimination, or microaggression that you witness against a student. This is a powerful system, but the most powerful part of the system is its transparency. It allows us and empowers us to collect data on who is being harassed, where they're being harassed, and how they are being harassed. Now this is difficult to say, but when we collected our first set of data, anybody want to guess where students reported the most harassment was, was occurring? Anyone? What did you say, Lori? In the classroom. In the classroom, not in fraternities, not in dining halls, not in the residence halls, in the classroom. And my colleagues and the deans and I were mortified, right? And it wasn't just that my colleagues were saying things or I was saying things, right? It was that we didn't have the basic pedagogical tools to interrupt bad situations, exclusionary situations, racist and sexist and homophobic situations that we saw unfolding. So we empowered the Teaching Center and other colleagues to begin, to begin to build a full suite of programs to give our faculty the basic tools to combat imposter syndrome, to combat microaggressions, to build fully inclusive classrooms. As Professor Kirkland noted, black studies, now known as African and African American studies, is 50 years old this year. We conferred departmental status 
on the program three years ago and under the leadership of Professor Gerald Early, African and African American Studies has moved fully into the 21st century with the ability to hire its own faculty and to pursue its own scholarly and teaching agenda autonomously. Our university is proud to provide a home for the Black Rep and the city's African Film Festival. Props to both Ron Himes and Wometa Tolliver Diallo. Our medical center continues to expand its research on racial disparities in health and also to promote community engagement, expanding its footprint and its work into North City and North County. Last fall, the medical center hired a chief diversity officer, Cherie Wilson, and named Dr. Will Ross the associate dean for diversity programs as the School of Medicine's principal officer for community partnerships. Our Chancellor, Mark Wrighton, who is stepping down at the end of this academic year, hired Dr. Ben Akande, the former Dean of Webster University and the former Chancellor of Westminster College, to lead Washington University's Africa Initiative, taking our academic and teaching and research footprint to this continent, which is crucial for the future of the world. I had the pleasure of leading a commission I had the pleasure of leading a commission on diversity inclusion which set out a blueprint for the university for the next several years. You can find it online, go to our homepage, type in, uh, type in commission on diversity. It's a long document, but one of the things that I want to pull out is that we did something that I have not seen any other research university do. We created an academy for diversity and inclusion. We created a department, a program whose sole job was to drive and change culture and climate at Washington University. And we appointed as the inaugural head of this amazing new program, my fierce colleague, Assistant Vice Chancellor Nicole Hudson, formerly a member of the Ferguson Commission, lead catalyst for Ford through Ferguson, and the former de deputy mayor for racial equity in the city of St. Louis. We are rightly proud of these accomplishments because they show us that change can happen when we put our minds, our shoulders, and yes, our hearts to the task. We still have so very much work to do on behalf of our students, our campus community, and the broader aims of justice in St. Louis. The ongoing effects of structural racism are powerful, but history has shown us that leaders can be equally powerful. I am delighted to introduce the next chancellor of Washington University, who I know is up to this task of continuing and leading this work. Andrew Martin is Washington University's chancellor-elect. He is my colleague in the law school, where he holds a professorship, as well as being a professor of political science. He is the former dean of the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, at the University of Michigan. Andrew is a leading scholar of political science. His research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and the National Institutes of Health. Andrew is very much coming home to Washington University. He earned his doctorate here in 1994, and until he became the dean at Michigan, he served on our faculty as the Charles Nagel Chair of Constitutional Law and Political Science, the founding director of the Center for Empirical Research, and as chair of political science, guiding our department into one of the best in the country. Andrew was recognized for his extraordinary scholarship and leadership with an Alumni Board of Governors Distinguished Faculty Award in 2013. On a more personal note, I witnessed Andrew's leadership in the law school, where he also served as the vice dean. I teach a large course of up to 100 students in estate planning, a course I enjoy because I can highlight the economics of injustice 
and how slavery and gender supremacy continue to be felt as intergenerational wealth is inherited or not. Andrew came to me one year and noted that I hadn't been able to teach the course I truly love, Slavery in the Law, which documents the role of daily law and ordinary judges in designing and reinforcing and building our architecture of racial supremacy in the early United States. Andrew asked if I wanted to teach that seminar again, and he made it possible for me to do so. More importantly, our students, who are so hungry to understand how law can reinforce or undo inequality and structural oppression, Andrew made it possible for them to learn this. I'm excited to have Andrew back at Washington University as a colleague and as a friend. But most of all, I am honored to have him back as our leader, one who already is empowering key conversations about campus diversity and institutional values, encouraging us to talk every day about who we want to be. He also understands the long arm of slavery and its corollary shadow, and that research universities like Washington University must take on our key role in tackling the world's intractable problems, including structural racism and racial disparities. Our Chancellor-elect, Andrew Martin. Thank you, Adrian, for that wonderful introduction and welcome and thank you for joining us here at Washington University in St. Louis as we commemorate 400 years since the first documented arrival of people of African descent to the United States. I am especially grateful to you, Jack Kirkland, for helping organize this event, uh, for inviting me uh, to be here today, and I'd also like to thank everybody else who worked to make this event possible. I'd also like to thank the Honorable Wesley Bell, St. Louis County Prosecutor, who will be serving as our keynote speaker. Thank you for being here. I am personally honored to have the opportunity to kick off this important event at Washington University, the first of three that we will hold throughout the year. At WashU, we consider this to be an, a significant moment in our history, and I believe we are one of the only universities in the country hosting a series such as this. I'm also delighted to see so many members of the broader community with us today. As Chancellor-elect, I'm deeply committed to strengthening our relationship with our surrounding neighbors and the greater community. Today, we consider the theme Black Struggle, Resiliency, and Hope for the Future, which is an awful lot to consider in just a few minutes. But if I may, I want to take a moment to reflect just briefly on how one WashU alumnus exemplified all of these qualities, struggle, resilience, and hope for the sake of the future. A man who embodied Frederick Douglass's words when he said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. That alumnus is Walter Moran Farmer, the first African American to graduate from Washington University Law School more than a century ago in 1889. Farmer devoted his entire life and career to advancing racial equity. He was a strong advocate for peaceful protest and served as a member of the St. Louis Committee of Five, a group that supported racial justice and denounced lynching. After his graduation from Washington University, Farmer went on to do incredible work. He was the first African American to serve in a judicial capacity in Missouri. He was the first black lawyer to argue before the Supreme Court of Missouri, and one of the first to go before the U.S. Supreme Court. Just by looking at his resume, a careless observer might assume that Farmer experienced little struggle on the road to success. But historic context reminds us that this is far from true. At that time, in our university, our city, and our nation's history, racial tension was immensely palpable. Farmer's graduation was just a few years before the U.S. Supreme Court decided Plessy versus Ferguson, which struck a resounding blow to desegregation efforts and served to legitimize racial supremacy. 
Knowing that context, it is not a big surprise that when Farmer participated in his commencement on this campus, his white counterparts refused to walk beside him. That moment, that one of being the only one in a crowd, the isolation and alienation he must have felt, that, my friends, is struggle. Nevertheless, and perhaps in spite of that struggle, Farmer went on to become an extraordinary lawyer and judge. Throughout his career, he defended many African Americans, many of whom lived right here in St. Louis, allowing their voices and testimonies to be heard. He fought tirelessly for his client's innocence and continued to seek justice in Missouri's courts. That, friends and colleagues, is resilience. So you might be asking, we have struggle, we have resilience, but where's the hope? Indeed, African Americans have embodied struggle and resi resilience ever since the first person of African descent set foot on U.S. soil. And here we are, 400 years later, with similar struggles and similar resilience, and it can be difficult to see the hope and fix our eyes on the future. There's one part of this story we must remember, though, and for that, we return to Farmer's graduation from Washington University. That day alone symbolizes hope. It symbolizes hope because it signifies progress, not just individually, but institutionally. Throughout his career, Farmer broke through significant barriers, often alone, so that others in the future wouldn't have to. His work, his struggle, and his resilience made way for African Americans to take on higher offices and leadership roles. Judge Bell, for example, is here today in part because of Farmer and other African American leaders who came before him. Beyond that, there is also hope in the fact that one person, one single person, stepped forward to walk beside Farmer so he wouldn't have to do it alone. That person was the dean of the law school. Therefore, while there is hope in this story for an entire group of people to find equity in education, career, compensation, criminal justice, and much more, hope for institutions like ours that can step up in big ways to make equitable strides in healthcare, STEM education, grading and college admissions, and racial tensions in our community, and more. Hope also resides in the one man who is willing to step forward and walk side by side for the sake of justice. It takes privileged leaders like the dean of the law school that day, like me, and like many of the others that are, many other leaders that are sitting in this room today, it's important to step up when others seem less willing. When we combine all of these things, individual struggle and progress, institutional mission and vision, and the responsibility of those in power, we can begin to see hope more clearly. At WashU, we aim to do just that, to make hope more visible. At WashU, we aim to hear the voice of struggle and resilience in order to achieve progress. At WashU, we aim to enhance our institutional efforts to make Washington University a place where all people feel represented, safe, valued, and included members of our community. And at WashU, we aim to act responsibly as we care for our students, faculty, staff, and patients here in St. Louis and throughout the world. As a university, we have made enormous strides since Farmer's graduation. We have committed to recruiting and retaining a highly diverse faculty and staff. We have improved access to a Washington University education for students of color, as well as those of varying socioeconomic backgrounds. We have hired key leaders who have helped give voice to the narratives of the past and who have facilitated dialogues across our differences. We have confronted racial disparities in medicine through research and patient care, and we have committed to being a leader in the local community around conversations surrounding race. In the last few centuries, we have come a long way, yet we still have a long way to go on the journey toward equity for our friends and colleagues of African descent. Though I am confident that through both individual and collective struggle, 
resilience, and hope, we will begin to pave the way for a thriving future for all people in our community. Thank you all for being with us here today. At Washington University, we are deeply committed to commemorating this moment in our nation's history. We are deeply committed to being a place where all people feel safe, represented, valued, and included. And we are deeply committed to fostering hope as we live out our mission to improve the livelihoods of students, the people of the greater St. Louis community, the country, and the world. Thank you all so much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I had a chance to meet Andrew, um, oh, it may have been about a month ago, at uh, Adrian's home, and uh, I asked him two questions. Uh, and the first uh, question was, um, would you speak to the community at large? And that question was answered, Resoundly, yes. When? And then my second question uh, to him was, what do you think about a university and its relationship with community? And he said, that's inevitable. That's obvious. How else can a university function if it's not in hands with a community? It's a couple. It's a grip. Uh, it's a unity that obviously cannot function otherwise. And so I knew then that we had the right person who got the right man. What you think? <laughs> and now we're going to have some, dan some, some dancing and drumming music. Ensemble. I am Miss Vivian Elang Anderson Watson Watt, and I want you to give a really big hand to our percussionists, our drum warriors, led by Baba Edward Brown. <laughs> gracias, gracias. We are so honored to be here today. We all know that February is the shortest month of the year, but it is the month that we can just blow it out and show ourselves. So these youth that you are getting ready to see, led by Miss Samantha Madison, they are going to do tributes. One of them is for the renowned, infamous Miss Catherine Dunham. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trainee. I'm so glad that so many of you clapped because I was like, I know everybody remember Miss Dunham. Okay, so having said that, our first number will be her tribute, followed immediately, not immediately, but immediately by our tribute for Baba Chuck Davis, another renowned choreographer. Um, and what do I want to say? He took the opportunity to go to the motherland and he brought back so many things for us. I go. Amen. I go. Amen. I go. Amen. Baba Chuck, I am listening. Thank you. So without any further ado, Better Family Life would like to present to you Kaumba Youth Performance Ensemble and their production and tribute to Catherine Dunham and Baba Chuck Davis. And we're going to start.
ko ilambe ilam 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 ko ilambe
Thank you so very, very much. Um, again, I am Mama Vivian, the artistic director and choreographer and tribute to Ms. Dunham, who I trained with. We are Better Family Life, and the youth that you just saw come to our after school program. Um, five days a week, two days a week, one day a week. Um, if you see them out, don't tell me how good they were. Tell them. That's who needs to know. That's who needs to know. Um, where's my vice president, Miranda Jones? And my parents, and really quick, if I have any parents in the audience, and Miranda Jones, my vice president, any BFL people, stand up and give a shout out. Thank you for coming. Appreciate you all. Come out, support, come to our program. Baba Ed, thank you. Drum Warriors, thank you. If, if anyone's sleeping by you, you know, would you just... <laughs> it's it's uh, my pleasure at this point to, to introduce uh, a, the next speaker who um, you actually see on your program. Um, and she's a, a relative of a person who has historical significance for for all of us historical and as much as um, slavery actually took a turn it changed um, it changed because of this particular runaway and as a result um, this individual uh, changed the designation of slavery to chattel, uh, which meant that basically as far as you run and as long as you run, it makes no difference you belong to somebody. Uh, and that, that somebody that you belong to had the right of ownership. And so it's always a, a pleasure to, to run into someone who is part of that history of courage, of running, of course, and, and the history of making uh, the country make a decision, uh, a decision of conscience, which it had to, at some point later, suffer, and, of course, at some point later, change. So it's my privilege to introduce to you a relative of the Dred Scott family, and she's the president and the founder of the foundation. Lynn? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Wow, well thank you first of all, Professor Kirkland and committee for inviting me to be a part of this important, important day. Uh, the 400 plus years is something that the world is just waking up to right now and fortunately you guys were right on top of it, but I run into a lot of people who don't know what we mean when we say 400 years. So I'm very pleased and proud and just humbled and privileged to be able to help bring that story forward by speaking about my ancestor, Dred, Scott and his wife Harriet Scott. A lot of people don't know that story and wherever I go I think oh you know I can just run on and tell them about this and tell them about that but then I realize after so many years that people still really don't know who he is or really why he's important and so I tend to go back and do a, a review of that but um, I'm hoping but I'm not assuming that most of you know who he is and of course I do this all the time and I find out no you really don't know but at the same time, I'm happy to share. I'm going to give you a brief overview, tell you why I do what I do, and some of the amazing divine outcomes of having been the great-great-granddaughter of Dred Scott and come to this point in my life, which I had no idea I was going to be doing this, not even 15 years ago. But Dred Scott was an enslaved person. He was in the family of Peter Blow, and Peter Blow lived in Virginia, and over some years, they came to St. Louis, and um, the family was not doing so well. The parents were ill, 
and they needed to cure debts. And so Peter Blow sold Dred Scott to a Dr. John Emerson, who was an army surgeon. Dr. Emerson took him into free territory, that being Fort Snelling in Mon uh, Minnesota, and also Fort Armstrong in Illinois. Now, both of those places, there was no slavery, allegedly. It was free territory. There was a rule that we had called once free, always free. Has anyone ever heard of it? A hand or two. So once free, always free meant that if an enslaved person or persons went into free territory, then they would be free if they resided there for any short amount of time or more. And certainly Dredd and Harriet lived in free territory for several years. When they came back to St. Louis in 1840, they were soon found to be the property, if you will, of Mrs. Emerson because Dr. Emerson passes away. Knowing that they'd been in free territory, knowing that she had met them there, knowing they had been in free territory, she refused to give them their freedom and she refused to let them buy their freedom. And so they had no recourse but to do what they had learned was possible and that was to go to the old courthouse downtown. And on April 6th of 1846, they filed for their petition to sue. And little did they know that it was going to take 11 years and five court proceedings for them to find out from the U.S. Supreme Court, that they were no, no free persons at all. In fact, they were deemed to be beings of an inferior order and so far inferior as they should not even associate with the white race. And this edict was pronounced on all African Americans. They were told they had no rights that the white man was bound to respect. And this was all because of a lot of political things going on in the background, which we don't have time for today, but ultimately on March the 6th of 1857, the Supreme Court of the United States told them they could not be free. And they also threw down some very critical laws that we'd had on the books. We kept slavery from being um, from coast to coast. In other words, the Missouri Compromise is the Northwest Ordinance. And these laws were struck down. And so slavery could have been from coast to coast. And this, of course, was a great catalyst for the Civil War. And we do know that the Civil War was fought and won in that, um, we were now able to have freedom. African Americans were now able to be free. So the Dred Scott story is one of a lot of courage, a lot of tenacity. There were a lot of sacrifices made, and I'll just share one right now, that they had to hide their two daughters away for maybe as long as two years just to save them from being sold away while these court proceedings were going on. But Dred and Harriet pursued, and in 1852, the Missouri Supreme Court said that they would no longer allow slaves to be free based on once free, always free, because we needed to tighten this up a little bit. Too many people were finding ways of getting out of slavery. So they were not only told that at the U.S. Supreme Court, they were told this at the Missouri Supreme Court. But I am happy to report that at least last year and now, hopefully this year, the Missouri Supreme Court will be vindicated if the Missouri legislature accepts HCR 10, which will renounce the 1852 decision. A lot of people feel like the Dred Scott case should be overturned. It was overturned by the 14th Amendment. And so the case has many ramifications. It was a prelude to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which are also called the Dred Scott Amendments, which are called the Reconstruction Amendments, which are those amendments which gave us abolishment of slavery, citizenship, and then the right to vote for African men. The story has a lot more to it, and it's very, very exciting, very interesting. But most of all, Dredd and Harriet pursued for 11 years at a great cost to their family. But in the end, they actually were freed by their owner's children. And that was an incredible thing because they had helped them along those 11 years. So the Dred Scott story is one of, of endurement and of fortitude and longevity. and um, and I think back about day to day, how did they live? How did they survive this? It's a wonderful story, but uh, in the end, a family who sought only to get freedom for themselves and their daughters actually helped to free a nation from slavery. And that's in a thumbnail is the story of Dred Scott. So I decided in 2006 that because the next year, it would be the 150th anniversary of the Dred Scott decision that we would do something and not just sit home as a family and watch it on television. So the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation was formed. At that time, I worked for Brian Cave Law Firm, and I always 
give my kudos and hat out to them because they were so, so supportive in that they allowed me to do whatever was necessary to get this going and to make a point of the fact that here we have 150 years later a family who has struggled but survived and has changed the nation and 150 years later we're still talking about him. Well, even more so since then and I want to thank Washington University too because in 2007 in this very room we had a wonderful ceremony here for the Dred Scott decision commemoration. At that time there was of course nothing to celebrate but as we come up on our 400 years we are going to celebrate, we're going to celebrate what African American contributions have been over those 400 years. And we're going to be highlighting that throughout the year, not just us but everyone who, who takes a part in that. And so the foundation was founded on three pillars, very simply commemoration, education, and reconciliation. Commemoration because of the anniversary, but also because there was nowhere on this planet a statue of Dred Scott. But by the work of the foundation, there is a statue of Dred and Harriet now on the east side of the old courthouse since 2012. And uh, it was commemorated um, on the 150th anniversary of their um, of their case. They also had um, Dred Scott Way, I'm sorry, Dred Scott Way was also changed outside the street where the courthouse is and that was done on the 150th anniversary of the day they got their freedom. They got their freedom about three months later by Taylor Blow and I want to make a point too, a lot of people say the old courthouse was where slaves were sold and yes indeed they absolutely were. But it's also the same place where Dred Scott got his freedom although shortly, by 12 white men in a jury, and that happened in 1850. It was short-lived because it was overturned, but they did get their freedom there as well. So we have lots to remember, lots to celebrate. The commemoration was such that Washington U did a symposium here for three days, and then Harvard University had one a month later, and I was privileged to be at both of those. We also have education, which is many things, but this year we're gonna start a literacy program because in my heart of hearts, there's just no excuse why anyone could not read in America. So we're happy to be doing that. And also reconciliation, and I think that's really where uh, we've really been able to make some serious inroads. We have had um, the privilege of meeting the Tawney family. Judge Tawney read the Dred Scott decision and the Tawney family has struggled with this for years. And so at this point in time, and I know I don't have a lot of time to go into it, we are actually working together, as well as families with Jefferson Davis, Thomas Jefferson, and uh, Dred Scott, the King family, many other descendants of families whose ancestors changed the nation. And we call them Dred Scott Presents Sons and Daughters of Reconciliation. So these things are happening. Also today, um, we can point to the fact that the Daughters of the American Revolution, who snubbed Marian Anderson in 1939, would not let her sing at Constitution Hall. But Eleanor Roosevelt took her to the Lincoln Memorial, where she sang for 75,000 people. Ever since then, the Daughters of the American Revolution have had a pretty bad reputation. But today, they have turned their reputation around, I believe. And if you will look on their website, you will see an incredible tribute to Marian Anderson. And I have been able to work with them at least on seven occasions, one of which when they actually presented me their Medal of Honor for the work we are doing. So things are changing. Um, I would like to share just a couple of quick more things. Uh, sons and daughters participated in the morning session for the National Judicial College, where all the judges in the country go to have training to learn how to be better judges. And in light of the things that have happened in the last few years, it was quite an honor to be on a panel with my sons and daughters group and share with the judges ways that they can look at how better to adjudicate from the bench. We're doing a lot of different things, but most of all, we're just happy to be able to say that it is 2019, it is 400 years, it is 50 years, it is all these anniversaries that we're now beginning to think about and to remember, and each one of us has a role to play. And as you sit out in the audience and listen to the speakers and hear about the forthcoming events, 
take the time to look and try to find a way to participate. We are actually going to hopefully have a stamp for Dred Scott for the first time. And the one way you can participate is to sign our petition online and just say, we'd like to see a Dred Scott stamp. Because after all these years, people are sure he's had one, but he has not. And so these are the things that turn things around. When people get involved and when they see something, they feel like they want to write and get it done. So I thank you for this opportunity. I am so blessed to do what I do. And God bless you all. Thank you. Our next speaker, of course, I know um, that you thought it was going to be me. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I have said what I wanted to say. It's in your brochure. Uh, I will do likewise for all of the, um, of the series. I'll put comments uh, in the brochure uh, for you to read. And as you can see, uh, I'm thinking that this is a, a real uphill struggle uh, to achieve social justice. And the first leg of that journey, of course, was the Constitution that, um, that stated that, yes, you are three-fifths a human being. I was very much involved in the second uh, rugged part of that climb uphill where it was a civil rights struggle and the conclusion after that tremendous struggle was yes you can be three-fourths three-fifths of a human being and the struggle continues uh, and we need an army and it's an army like the people in this room um, to be enlisted and then joined in that battle uh, so that we can make the five-fifths and the wholeness the fact that we are all equal in this society. And I think it's really proper uh, to introduce our next speaker because um, that's, that's his goal. Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, spend some time with him. As a matter of fact, I met him um, at the uh, city council. Um, I was presenting something at the city council. It was something unique. And, and as this was occurring, I got very little support for the idea. Uh, except uh, from the next speaker, who was very supportive. Uh, and then uh, later, I, I found that he was going to run for an office, uh, which, no way, no way, <laughs> that he could possibly win this. <laughs> uh, and you see, he, he seemed just too nice, <laughs> too understanding. <laughs> uh, and guess what? Not only did he run, but he was pushed by people like you in this room. And you support him, and we have tremendous support for him. We have great expectations of him. And I can tell you, I believe strongly that I will not be disappointed. And so you see his bio. I don't have to tell you who he is. I'm under no illusion that you came here just for me. <laughs> so I give you the Honorable Wesley Bell. Good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is at this point. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, 
And I know I'm, and I know few people thought I would be here today. And I'm not even talking about the election. I'm talking about driving from Chicago and the storm and the snow. <laughs> and so uh, black struggle, resiliency, and hope had an additional meaning for us <laughs> as we were driving through. Um, it is good to be back on this campus. Years ago, I was accepted into this great law school, and had they give me any, given me any scholarship money, I may have attended this great law school. <laughs> but I did see a play here a few months ago, so it's good to be back <laughs> on campus. Um, so I do um, um, want to thank you, um, and it's an honor to be a part of this conversation that we're having openly here in St. Louis around race, prosperity, and justice. I do want to acknowledge Professor Kirkland for organizing this event, and also to everyone who makes up this community here at Washington University, to the men and women who work very hard every day to ensure that this campus is cared for and operates smoothly, to the students from all over the world who seek out this institution and the culture and knowledge it represents, to the faculty and staff that strive to be, to ensure world-class standards in education and research, and to Chancellor Wrighton, to Chancellor-elect Chancellor Martin, to Provost Thorpe, and to the Board of Trustees for their leadership and guidance, both on campus and in our community at large. Uh, thank, you for all, thank you all for welcoming me here today and for the opportunity to speak on the history of blacks in America and, and to the lessons that I draw from it when considering criminal justice reform, which is perhaps the greatest challenge now facing our nation. What is the heart of this nation? What is America's bedrock belief? What is our deepest truth? Is it not simply freedom and the liberty and justice that freedom promises? 55 years ago, the Reverend Joseph Jackson questioned the nature of the civil rights struggle and identified a saliency of purpose in the founding documents of this country. He proclaimed, this is a struggle for full freedom, justice, and equality before the law. It's a struggle to bring from paper the lofty ideals of America and to apply them in practice to the lives and actions of all Americans. In reality, it is America's struggle to be herself, to fulfill the highest promises of her being, and to build a social order after the pattern and dreams of our founding fathers and in the light of the wisdom of the ages. These words resonate deeply with me as I consider my own ancestry. I stand before you today as a testament, the inheritor of a dozen generations of people with this skin color who lived, strived, and died on the soils of America. The great, great, great grandparents who spent their entire lives never knowing the freedom that I enjoy. More freedom perhaps than my parents have known and yet hopefully less freedom than my own children will experience over the course of their lives. 400 years, 400 years of struggle, 400 years of struggling for freedom in the land of the free. Struggling for a freedom inseparable from the words that form the documents that gave birth to this nation a freedom that proclaims the equality of all men and the right to liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness. What better aim than to struggle for this freedom? And that is precisely what millions of Americans who trace their ancestry to Africa have done for the past 400 years. Despite being deprived of liberty based solely on the color of their skin, blacks in America have never ceased their pursuit of the freedoms denied for generations. And it is in the stories of these struggles in the history of this country that we see one of the most inspiring chapters of all human history, endeavoring to endure when the laws and even the very heart of your nation are turned against you requires a courage beyond what many Americans will ever find necessary for their daily survival. Blacks in America embody this courage and it has led us through the past 400 years. Slavery reigned in this land long before America was America. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, 
and the Bill of Rights. These three documents are collectively known as the charters, as the charters of freedom. And yet the lofty ideals of the founding fathers had no immediate effect on the freedom of my ancestors 243 years ago. In fact, it would be another 32 years in 1808 when Congress banned the further importation of slaves to our shores. Yet my ancestors remain property and their freedom elusive. For the next 50 years, tensions increased as moral imperatives became more salient and finally, a moment that will forever shine as one of the greatest triumphs of America, President Lincoln proclaims my ancestors forever free. With the 13th Amendment, slavery is abolished and the next year of the first Civil Rights Bill of 1866 passed to ensure that all persons born in the United States were, de were declared to be citizens of the United States. I would, be, I, would not, I would be remiss not to point out that American Indians were in excluded from the rights granted by that bill. But, but, but with the time that we have here, it doesn't allow me to have that um, important conversation as well. Two years later, Dred Scott, the infamous case from St. Louis that led to the Civil War, is overturned through the ratification of the 14th Amendment and its definition of citizenship. Another two years and another triumph, African Americans received the right to vote in 1870. Freedom seemed even more within reach but struggle remained our constant companion. Over the intervening century and a half, we see reconstruction end and a mass migration northwards to escape old oppressions reenacted under new laws. We watch helplessly as Jim Crow laws crush down on our hopes of freedom. And as the 20th century approaches, we go and take our seats at the back of the bus and read the news that we shall now remain separate despite being equal as the Supreme Court finds segregation to be constitutional in Plessy v. Ferguson. For another 58 years, we struggle on until finding hope through Brown v. Board of Education and the Supreme Court striking down the separate but equal status. And then arises the greatest reason for hope that we've yet seen in America. And we are lifted up by the courage of all the famous and all the nameless champions of the civil rights movement. 345 years after the first landing on these shores, the promised freedoms of America seemed within reach as the new Civil Rights Act passes and prohibits discriminations of, discrimination of all kinds. And the next year, even more protections are granted to ensure African Americans the right to vote. To be sure, St. Louis and Missouri at times have been on the forefront of the struggle. There were Dred and Harriet Scott's suits for their freedom and Lloyd Gaines' suit, suit to be admitted to the University of Missouri Law School in St. Louis, my alma mater. Gaines', Gaines suit was one of that one that set the table for Brown versus Board of Education. There was St. Louis's Shelley Smith, who sued, sued against racial covenants in St. Louis neighborhoods, led to a landmark victory in the U.S. Supreme Court in 1948. There was Joseph Lee Jones' suit against St. Louis realtors for racial discrimination that led to a landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1968 that allowed claims against private parties based on the 13th Amendment purpose to eliminate the badges and incidents of slavery. A commission appointed by President Truman recommended in 1947 that higher education be desegregated the chancellor of this university dissented, but to be fair, the Missouri Constitution at the time forbade the education of whites and blacks together. Although the 1954 Brown decision negated our state, state ban on integration, Missouri voters did not get around to removing the offending provision until 1976. Washington University began accepting blacks in the 1950s and today seeks to be a leader in providing educational opportunities for all races. But we must be mindful of history. Martin Luther King was in Memphis linking the economic plight of low-wage sanitation workers to the civil rights struggle when he was murdered 51 years ago. The struggle for racial and economic justice extends to the fight to make minimum wage an adequate wage, a struggle that continues to this day at this university and other elite institutions. In all this, we are reminded of a common theme, and that is the mutable nature of the laws of man. 400 years, 
400 years of laws, 400 years of laws that have oppressed, and also laws that have uplifted. New laws can enforce behaviors, but they are never guaranteed to change hearts. Laws that protect freedom so long denied to black people can often take generation, can take a generation or more to permeate society's morals. Dr. King taught us that there are two kinds of laws, the just and the unjust. Laws that are moral and laws that are not, he wrote. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. We have in our history again and again found cause to examine the morality of our laws or the lack of protection through law. We examine their evolution, their execution, and their effects across society to determine, is this law just or unjust? We've seen this cycle repeat throughout the struggle for freedom, equality, and justice. A new judgment is passed, a new protection put in place, or an unjust one removed and its punitive measures revoked. We come to the end of this 400 years of all the laws that have been lifted and levied, and we find ourselves yet examining again the justness of our legal system. And we watch its evolution that has resulted in the criminalization of poverty and its disproportional incarceration based on race. We see the ways that these laws are executed, the indiscriminate harms that ripple out across communities, and we come to ask ourselves, where is the heart of America? Where is the highest ideal of our freedom, all of our freedom? You are never truly free if your brother is in chains. And today, too many chains that bind are invisible to the eye. Around 1975, the prevailing opinion of criminologists was that our modern prison system would soon disappear. The data that they had at the time was showing the incarceration was much, wasn't much of a crime to deterrent of a crime deterrent, I should say. And they also knew when, that when people who come in contact with the criminal justice system, are, they are more vastly likely to reoffend. How shocking then to look at the state of incarceration in America today. 45 years ago, we knew this approach didn't work, but that knowledge failed to prevent what, is, what has become one of the greatest ills of our society. We know the war on drugs has failed but black Americans still suffer disproportionately higher consequences for drug use. Today, whites and blacks use drugs at similar rates, but a black person is three, more, three times more likely to be arrested. Injustices in our legal system can harm people of every color, but by far the color of skin most oppressed by mass incarceration, criminal, criminalized poverty, and the overuse of pretrial detention is black skin. We look at the evolution of where we are now and the laws that exist and are enforced across St. Louis, Missouri, and the nation, and we must ask, for, ask ourselves, why do we have the rule of law? The answer, of course, is to protect the safety of our families and communities. We as a society choose to abide the rule of law, but we must ask ourselves, does our current system make us safer? Are our communities healthier? Are they happier? Or does your skin color and your family's economic status increase the chances that you will suffer injustice at the hands of the law? What do we say to the child born today in Ferguson and the baby born yesterday in Chesterfield? Do they not have the exact same rights to freedom and equal justice? 400 years of this struggle, marked by the resilience of every American who has suffered oppression, we see it most dramatically in the history of Americans who came here via Africa perhaps by the way of England. And the only conclusion in which we find justice, the only reality in which liberty is protected for every one of us is one in which no practice of law imposes criminal penalties that are disproportionately punitive relative to the crime's impact on society. We have decided that the most minor of offenses and many that, are, that aren't so minor yet share the hallmarks of not having a victim and not being marked by violence are enforced differently for some people in our communities than they are for others. This unequal enforcement locks people in cycles of, of oppression and poverty, and when our region has significant swaths of its population living without hope for their future, 
just the mere struggle for survival, we limit the vibrancy of, that our community is capable, capable of. We limit the growth of our region. We limit the opportunities available to those who live here and those who want to come here. If we cannot take care of our own neighbors, our own communities, our own St. Louis, how can we expect new businesses, new employees, new, new neighbors to move here? We want a St. Louis that attracts more prosperity and opportunity, and we can have that, but to get there, we have to protect for all those who call St. Louis home, their freedom and equality. Our first black president perfectly encapsulated this when he said, justice is not only the absence of oppression, it is the presence of opportunity. When systems are broken and cause harm, where their original intent was to improve the, the conditions of society, then those systems are ripe for restructuring. The systems we're looking at now, the legal system, the criminal justice system, these are ripe for restructuring. We have the data from efforts underway all across the country that shows the way we're doing it here now isn't the way that, that's going to get us to the St. Louis that we all want to be, to the St. Louis that we all want to call home. Our past does not define our future unless we let it. I see our past here in St. Louis and stretching back 400 years to Virginia shores as an illustrative guide to how a society knows when systems are broken and what, what the most effective course of action to be taken is to restructure that system, to balance the scales of laws back to the foundation of this country, to the freedom that is the spirit of America, to the liberty that is inherently in the hearts of all of us, to the justice that each soul knows is due their equal measure, all of us together. But I say more so, this is a pivotal moment in our common history, in our American history. 400 years of struggle, 400 years of resiliency, and here we are at hope. I am hopeful because for 400 years we've all been here in America where all men are created equal, even if all laws are not. I am hopeful because for 400 years, we have proven through our struggle that it is possible to change the laws of the land. And I'm hopeful because after 400 years, we have the knowledge and the will to examine what is broken and begin to restructure our system of law so that all men and women are guaranteed equal justice. I'm not saying there isn't more struggle to come. But I look around and I, see of all, and I see all of us gathered here together to witness the, this reality and resolve to do our part in advancing justice. Together we will build a safer St. Louis. We know the way forward. And together we can examine and evolve the systems that need rebalancing in order, to, in order for equal justice to be known for all. The changes St. Louis residents voted for that put me in office as the first African-American to serve as prosecutor here. These changes are worthy of celebration, but there's much work to be done if we are to reclaim for all our citizens the freedom that are, that are their rights as Americans. Let us not linger too long in celebration, but look ahead at the work to come. I will remind you of the words of a black woman who was one of the earliest modern advocates for criminal justice reform and who herself was long imprisoned and later free. Angela Davis reminds us to, for we know that victories are possible through the struggles they demand, though the struggles they demand are long and arduous. So let our elation merge with a pledge to carry on this fight until a time when all the antiquated ugliness and brutality of jails and prisons linger only as a mere memory. As a prosecuting attorney charged fully with the mandate to protect the safety of our communities, ensure victims receive justice, and uphold the law equally for all men and women, I will continue to reform that which is possible to change in order to ensure every resident of St. Louis County their constitutional freedoms and protections. I stand before you today as a testament, the inheritor of the freedoms imbued to citizens of this nation because of the struggles of millions the struggles of a million nameless men and women who never lost hope in the promise of America. Thank you, may God bless you and keep you.
I want to thank you very much for uh, your attendance. Uh, you realize that in June, I expect not only to see you again, but your neighbors and other members of your family. <laughs> I, uh, that, that applause really is for you. You've done a, you've been a very excellent audience and uh, very supportive. And I'm very, very, very thankful and fond of you for showing up for our Chancellor-elect. So, so drive, drive home, be careful and uh, see you in June.